Hi everybody and welcome to this session of the Green Steve's Making Solar Simpler series. Um, today's session is a deep dive into local authority strategies and the way that local authorities consider their options in terms of delivering both solar PV but also solar PV in the context of other renewables projects. Um, and we're delighted to be joined by Katie Sargent. Katie is the Greener Future Groups Manager at Surrey County Council and has had the, I was going to say good fortune, but probably arguably misfortune, Steve, of working with both of us in the past. Um, <laughs> but, but, but most importantly, has a lot of relevant experience of kind of taking key strategic decisions in respect of, yes, solar, but also kind of biodiversity schemes, ecology schemes, and effectively taking choices in a in a sort of environment where there are constrained budgets there is only so much that can be done um and you're trying to kind of get the best bang for your buck for 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 green for green energy and net zero solutions against the council's local authority um targets so so in that regard katie thanks for joining us thank you for having me um i think should we start should we start from the very beginning which is sort of how the how the net zero journey started at, at Surrey County Council probably way back to when you declared a climate emergency and what happened what happened following that yep great um so the declaration of the climate emergency really was sort of catalyst for action at Surrey so there had been I think Surrey was not the only local authority that had had some lean years um, in the climate change space prior to that. So in 2019, there was sort of national energy sort of bubbling away, some really sort of active um, sort of voluntary pressure groups that were um, starting to ask some really good questions about why local authorities weren't doing more um, to tackle climate change. And so then across the country, local authorities started to declare climate emergencies and at the same time, Surrey um, did declare climate emergency. Um, and then, you know, there was quite a large sort of recruitment drive that followed that. Um, and we sort of, we, we we aligned with government. We said that we that Surrey as a county would be net zero carbon by 2050. Um, we also put in place a more ambitious target for our own organisation. So the council buildings, fleet, street lights, et cetera, to be net zero by 2030. Um, and in 2020, we um, published our climate change strategy, which set out the ambition. And then the year after that, our climate change delivery plan, which um, sort of explained how we would do it or how it could be done. I think that's I think that's that's a really good start. And I think it brings us neatly on to the first the first topic that I really want to get into today, which is it's one thing declaring a climate emergency it's another thing sort of having the delivery plan to to make it work and i think one of the things steve and i have found across a lot of local authorities is sometimes there is no delivery plan and sometimes the delivery plan perhaps doesn't pan out the way people think and it needs to be a live document it needs to keep evolving if i sort of maybe ask you you both about that both your experiences of perhaps it not kind of working in the first sense as you might have initially thought and needing to be changed and kept alive and then secondly kind of is it it's one thing sort of achieving the principle it's another thing kind of making the choices that are inherent in the delivery plan because they come with a cost i think that i think my um first comment on on what katie said steve is is that uh, you used the word catalyst i think that's a really good word so what what i found was i'd been involved in um, helping a lot of local authorities prior that to that um, to to um, formulate uh, climate broader climate change strategies, and it seemed to me that in almost all the authorities that I can think of, that that funneled into the climate emergency. So the climate emergency, in other words, took over the broader piece, if you like, and that became the focal point. And um, the second thing you said was a recruitment drive, of course. We, we'll keep coming back to this, won't we? You've got to have the resources, and and I've I've uh, got some thoughts about that for for, for later on, maybe. Um, and setting targets or or setting new targets, perhaps, and uh, publishing a strategy and then an action plan. That is exactly that is textbook on how you should do it, of course. Um, but I think that uh, perhaps Steve's point is that I think 
some authorities, if we just break that down a little, some authorities um, um, firstly declared targets that they had no idea they could make. Didn't even, even dare I say it? Even the members didn't really understand what they what they were signing up to. And and I give you the simple example of those authorities that chose a ridiculously uh, quick target like 2025 and included all scope three emissions in it. And you go, well, how did you how did you come to this? You know, I'm, I I want to I want to understand how you came to it. And of course, the, the the way they came to it was a pressure group turned up at the council meeting where under their standing orders you're allowed five minutes minutes and whatever and they passed it without any officers having any involvement yeah. in it at all so i think that, the, that there was definitely some issues around that but generally the climate emergency did have a really beneficial effect i think and the the, the growth of a movement via that and and you've certainly certainly benefited from that so we scratched our heads quite a lot when we were developing our delivery plan because what we could have done was we could have just focused on the things that we have within our control. So we were, you know, there was quite, there still is, you know, government funding available, there's policies we can put in place. Um, but that was, we knew that wasn't going to come anywhere near close enough to achieving what needed to happen. So we took the approach of looking, doing a sort of a science based pathway. We worked um, with some consultants who helped us um, in through the PCAN network to, to do that. So looking at what needed to be achieved, our delivery plan runs from 2021 to 2025. So the idea was we chunk it up into five year chunks yeah. and we'd look um, obviously with the science based pathway, you really need to sort of escalate your emission reduction in the first years rather than waiting to 2040 and then doing everything at that point. But we were seeing um, really huge um, targets coming out of that approach. So, for example, we said, by 2025, we need to have decarbonised 20% of all fuel poor households. Um, you know, we need to have reduced journeys with ICE vehicles by, I can't remember the percentage, but these were big percentages. You know, businesses, we need to reduce emissions by 30%. Um, and so that is set out in our delivery plan. But what we have done is we've said this can't be achieved by the local authority alone. Our strategy and our delivery plan is very much a partnership approach, working with public and private sector partners, critically with residents, but also pointing out that responsibility that government need to take. And so quite a big part of our approach is lobbying. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, there's, oh, sorry, Steve. There's a, there's a, there's, a, sorry, there's a couple of interesting bits in there I just really wanted to pick up on. So the first one <laughs> was, was just about, I'm conscious you said that you were, you split it up into kind of five year chunks and you're you're sort of rapidly approaching dare I say it, you're approaching the end of chunk one so yeah. I just it'd be interesting to sort of get a sense of kind of how chunk one's gone because and then and then secondly it'd be interesting to get a sense I think of what areas have been more challenging than others so you listed a few there I think lots of local authorities I've worked with have had a fairly decent go at kind of reducing their own emissions and their direct emissions and those types of things that is not easy but is the lower of the hanging fruit but then mm -hmm. you referred to kind of individual household fuel consumption individual household use now that's where the and any of yeah. those energy efficiency schemes that is steve and i had what could charitably be described as a very depressing session on energy efficiency in our green steve seminars where I'm not sure we quite reached the point of giving up and despair, Steve, but I don't think we were far away. So it'd be interesting to, given you are looking at it across those segmented sectors, yeah. kind of how it's going, how it's going and where the challenges are there. Mm -hmm. So there are two things I'd say to that. Firstly, I and mean, you might want to come back to this, we did quite a lot of work looking at the cost of our net zero target because we didn't want, like you said, just to commit to something without any idea because we would get freedom of information questions from someone. So we did a lot of work um, and what we found was that our 2030 target was going to cost us somewhere in the region of 80 to 100 million and that um, to, by 2030 and that just within that five year period to, re to reduce emissions by what we needed to against the 2050 county target, we were looking at somewhere between two to four billion pounds. So that really framed to us that 
this <laughs> wasn't something the council would be able to afford to do by itself. Yeah. Um, but the approach we've taken with that is looking at finance mechanisms to take an enabling approach for um, to, to support residents and businesses um, and drawing in funding and, and looking at investment opportunities. But in answer to your question about how it's going, we have committed to take a progress um, update report back to Cabinet every year. Um, and we've done that um, twice now. And we are on track with our 2030 targets, fortuitously, because prior to 2019, um, the council got a whole load of funding through Salix to decarbonise our street lighting. So that was happening anyway. Um, but since then, we've been fortunate to draw in funding through the Public Sector Decarbonisation Fund to start to decarbonise our buildings. And I've got a brilliant team who are really good at getting that funding. Um, and that doesn't come without its challenges, but it definitely helps to make the case to Cabinet that we should be decarbonising these buildings and starting with the ones with old boilers. So we are on track there. From a 2050 perspective, COVID was actually very helpful um, because what we saw was emissions dropping right down um, at the point where we needed a significant reduction. And so we were on track in the first year of reporting, which surprised us because we weren't expecting to be. Um, and then last year when we took our report to Cabinet, we were starting to go off track. Um, and the biggest challenge really is, you know, particularly transport in Surrey. It is not decarbonising as fast as we need it to. And I've just remembered the, the target in our climate change delivery plan is a 16 to 31% reduction in private vehicles by 2025. So it's, it's not happening. I, I, there's a couple of points I could make there, uh, Steve. I think that the first thing is that um, the, the costs are, are are huge, aren't they? But as we hear in the national policy framework, which is something we covered a couple of um, sessions ago, um, generally, hopefully, the amount of growth and jobs and business created from the uh, path to net zero should make it worthwhile. So it's not just a cost, is it? It's 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 a it's a it's a pathway to to get something else. But that's also where I think you need to draw a distinction between um, climate change and energy, because the, the 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 very interesting thing about what you've said, Katie, is that um, quite often the, a, a local authority might have all sorts of things about energy. But when you get into the energy efficiency and fuel poverty and all that, they haven't got a great deal because those are much harder, as Steve has, has rightly pointed out. Um, but of course, the the irony of it is that um, some of those things in the uh, the former category are costs that you, unless you get some government funding, you can't really do much about, whereas energy can make you a profit. It's as simple as yeah. that. So you, yeah. you can actually make money from solar uh, solar farm projects as, and you're involved in those in your authority and I'm involved in them and Steve's involved in them, a, lo a load of other authorities all over the place. And they're looking at potential um, uh, gains of IRR of north of 10 percent, um, particularly if you've got I've got a couple of good ones where it's right next to an airport or a, a big hospital or something and it works really well. And it but the. The broader play is to balance one off against the other. So you've got all of the, the, the benefits and you're, dare I say, you're, you're actually funding some of them through yeah. gains in energy. Absolutely. And that's how we've structured our 2030 finance model. So we've got measures like thermal insulation and heat pumps, which are absolutely essential to achieve the carbon reduction we need, but aren't paying for themselves as is currently and then we're offsetting those costs with roof mounted solar yeah. led so quick win measures and we've got to constantly be mindful of that balancing act because the council is very supportive of this agenda yeah. um however they they're also facing you know financial pressures like most local authorities yeah. and so our agenda is considered to be funded borrowing so as long as we can show a balanced business case then it's much easier for us to get agreement for the capital investment that we need to do those sorts of measures. Yeah. And I think that's I think that's really interesting in a couple of areas. I think there's there's the bits on the kind of the, the bits that kind of lend themselves to a business case. And we'll come back to talk about some of those in a minute, because I know I know Surrey in particular are pretty proactive on this stuff and you've got some got some good things going on. I think it's just it is stark to kind of and without wanting to dwell on sort of perhaps the, the harder side, there are some bits of this agenda that still 
I don't think immediately lend themselves to an obvious business case. So retrofit is one example where obviously you're talking about sort of, I think UK wide, it's saying like 26 million homes need a retrofit between now and 2050, yeah. which I think works out about one and a half homes every minute. Um, the local authorities, rightly or wrongly, are kind of being tasked with that. Nobody's got the money to deliver that agenda. And actually, it doesn't lend itself to an immediately financeable business model either in the way that solar does, which generates a revenue stream and all of those things. So it'd be can worth I, kind can of... I just, can I just jump in there? Though? Cause yeah, go, Steve. There's a point here, isn't there? Is that um, Katie mentioned COVID. Mm. And at the end of COVID, of course, they had the national policy, didn't they? Build back better. And they missed such an opportunity. He, the prime minister then could have said, I'll throw a couple of billion towards just doing insulation in domestic houses. And it would have created thousands of jobs and it would have delivered something huge in our agenda. And they just missed it completely, didn't they? It was such a, it was such a missed opportunity. Yeah. Sorry, I, I interrupted you. But, you, you know, that was the point about no business case. They, they could have done it instead of yeah. us having to find a business case. Yeah, exactly. And then and then sorry, there are then the bits which obviously do have a business case. And I want to kind of bring you onto onto those, Katie, because I know you, you're doing a lot of really good things about those. And some of those you're doing to kind of achieve kind of the green agenda within the local authority and others. You're using a bit for that and a bit for a revenue raise. So do you want to talk us through some of the solar things you've kind of been exploring and and to what extent they kind of work to raise revenue and to what extent they work to kind of facilitate net zero? Because I think they can potentially happily do both. Yes, absolutely. So, yeah, it, it's quite nice to be in this space where, you know, we, we we're facing cuts as a local authority, but we've actually got some really interesting and exciting opportunities to generate income. Um, and so... Yes, we've looked for a while now at solar. I have to say Surrey isn't doing very well at all compared to other um, local authorities in the south um, because we, we started from zero basically at, in, in 2019. And so other places like Kent um, are, are doing much better. So we do need to catch up. But that also means that the grid hasn't got a huge amount of solar going into it in the Surrey area. So, you know, there are opportunities and challenges in the space. So we need we know that we need to put solar on the rooftops of about at least 75 percent of SCC owned buildings in order to balance our, our 2030 decarbonisation target. And that is can, still continues to be the best, the most sensible place for us to start. And so we are now starting to do that. Um, we just have to make sure that we balance that with the sort of asset strategy approach that our land and property team are doing. And again, I, we're not unique here that, you know, the sort of assets, the sort of the portfolio of buildings is shrinking in Surrey as it is elsewhere. And so you don't want to make a huge amount of investment in a building that then is going to be sold. We've experimented with a couple of solar canopies over car parks. We were successful in getting some funding to do one of those. We've now done another one in our HQ in Rygate. Um, we're also interested in solar farms um, and so a good couple of years ago now we did some initial work um, with a consultant to look at all of Surrey's land and and land owned by the boroughs and districts and we funded that to identify how much solar potential so ruling out lands that was you know very sort of, sort of triple, triple SI land or you know land that was built on or you know all of the heritage lands or land with very high agricultural value we ruled out all of that land and what we found was that at a very high level there was 350 megawatt worth of potential on SCC land and when you threw in the borough and district land as well that was 500 megawatts but at that point we weren't we didn't realize how challenging it was going to be with the grid to bring any of these projects forward so we've gone through quite a lot of whittling down um, Stephen, you're familiar with this, um, looking at different sites, speaking to planning, speaking to our land and property, speaking to the, the team that manage our um, farming tenancies, um, looking at grid connections. And we've got it down to about seven sites now that we're seriously pursuing. Um, we've worked with a consultant to get um, DNO uh, sort of responses to determine when we would be able to make connections and it's not looking particularly positive for some of those sites. We do have an interesting site on a closed landfill where there's a potential PPA off taker um, and so we're pursuing with the sites that have the most legs. Also we have to consider the political elements here because 
you know that is always something we need to be mindful of. I, I do know as well that when you were going through how you were excluding land from your determination, you did leave in green belt land, which which is you can develop, but it is more of more of a challenge, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Um, in 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 that sense, but I, I think those certainly um, Steve and I have found in in projects um, uh, planning grid tenancies. Are, are definitely the biggest ones. I, I did a project for um, Staffordshire County Council uh, looking over numerous huge estates. They own masses and masses of land and a lot of them were excluded because there was a tenancy, a farm business tenancy yeah. that was lasting another 20 years. He said, well, you can't, yeah. the compensation you'd have to pay to get out exactly. of that. Exactly. And even if the tenancy is rolling and you could terminate it within a year, you wouldn't necessarily want to do that because of no. political fallout because you know that's that's someone's livelihood and so we have to be yeah. really mindful of where we what we try and find is a sort of unicorn solution yeah. where the farmer wants to actually give up the tenancy and it's close yeah. enough to a grid connection and it may be in green belt but it's not in line of sight because if we ruled out green belt we wouldn't really have very many opportunities no, at all no. well there's some good there's some uh, there's some good precedents now uh sharp richard uh, produced a um, an article last year on a, a, a quoting a couple of precedents where the planning inspector had said that the, the damage to the green belt was outweighed by the benefit of the renewable energy, which is the, 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 the legal test. Um, but I, I think um, grid, of course, is something that we should say should improve because there is this national incentive now to say we're going to look at the whole queue and the ones who are in, who've got a grid um, connection offer that they have accepted but are not in a position to proceed are going to start being demoted down the queue or dare I say even thrown out of the queue um, and it, that should open up um, more opportunities and local authorities of course can play can play the longer game. Interestingly we had a select committee with the um, energy utility companies a, a couple of weeks ago so yeah. our members wanted to have a chance to scrutinise um, the, the DNOs and we had um, re representatives there from all of the main sort of energy companies and DNOs which was really interesting, interesting. and we they did say to us that even though this was happening, there's still a huge amount coming in all the time. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, getting onto the queue as, as soon as possible really is the advice. We did pitch that they maybe could be more favourable to local authorities, but they unfortunately are um, not able to give any special treatment because of the, the laws that they have to follow. Sometimes, though, you do get that informally, I think. Um, I, I, I mean, as, um, in my work for APSI, I, I have visited... Um, DNOs with two or three officers from the local authority and we've literally had a list of sites and we've gone through them and they've got the heat map there and they're looking at it live and talking us through it just like it was an internal meeting and and how valuable is that Steve eh? if they if they'll say you know that's not really the site there's a lot of issues with that one goes to this substation but this one you could do it that way and whatever and helped us refine down to our three best opportunities because the other point about grid as well of course that might not be um uh, widely known is that your your two ways of proceeding are to try and get a budget cost or to make an application and from my experience if you go for a budget cost they're not binding of course sometimes the dno don't take them that seriously they get the junior you know it's like the article clerk in the old days <laughs> to do it um and uh, and therefore quite often they're inaccurate whereas the only way you will find out is if you actually make the application pay the application fee and an engineer looks exactly at the network and says how mm -hmm. it would be done so did you get, Katie, what else did you get from the DNOs when you were, it's good that they were willing to engage, to be honest, even that, even that, it feels like a real step forward. I'm, I'm curious to know if they, if they had any other big, big takeaways, because I, I can see it from their perspective, it is difficult, even with the new mechanisms to sort of remove people from the queue, this is hard. Yeah, it was really useful, actually. I think that we were surprised that they all agreed to come. I think the fact that we, we did it behind closed doors, so most of our, yeah. um, sort of scrutiny is, is available online, but this was a private session. Yeah, yeah, sure. And so they really talked us through the sort of the situation, the challenges from their perspective, what they're trying to do to, to rectify that. The fact that they're really very reliant on the national grid. They gave us some advice. 
We talked a lot about um, local area energy planning as well, and the fact that this is an, uh, something that local authorities, again, there's an expectation that we lead on it, but with very little sort of funding or support from, from government and whether there was anything that they could we could do jointly in that space to develop those. Um, and then we talk quite a lot because members are very interested in digging up roads and the mm. <laughs> impacts of that on residents. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, when you when you kind of come to consider, so, so it seems to me some of the things I've taken from that are kind of things in a way they've kind of confirmed some of the biases perhaps that I had before, say rooftop solar, obviously good behind the meter connection might not require grid connection all good news has roof space has sort of enables you to reduce demand all really positive whereas new solar farm in open field needs grid connection is time consuming is expensive um one of the things i think i was kind of kind of curious about is now you're really weighing up against a number of other things so as the solar business case has moved on what we tend to find now is we're doing lots of things with local authorities that sort of enable other uses of land. And by that, I'm thinking sort of monetizing biodiversity net gain. Um, yeah. And biodi and and other we've even done in in some of some sort of relevant relevant places in the UK, we've done kind of nitrogen credits and things like that. And I'm wondering if is is there a sense that perhaps the solar case in places is too hard, but there are other uses for land, but as in so you you do still have a portfolio of land. How do you weigh that up? Because it's it's not immediately just oh solar is the answer I don't think. Yes so, so the one thing we haven't mentioned is the solar PPA opportunities for other buildings but maybe you want, might want to yeah. come back onto that yeah. but in terms of sticking with land my director for environment has always taken the approach that you need to get multiple uses out of your mm. land you might have one main use but really in this day and age it has to be serving more than one purpose and you know with the ecology crisis as well so biodiversity and ecology also sits in my group even though my background isn't in it so it's every day's a school day in that sense <laughs> but but BNG is incredibly interesting and the opportunities to combine yeah. that with with a solar farm potentially and, and and woodland planting for carbon sequestration purposes and thinking about land use change um, the problem we have there is that we need better metrics so we know there's the woodland carbon code so we can plant we've got a target to plant 1.2 million new trees in Surrey. Surrey is already the most wooded county in England but this is part of our um, carbon reduction car uh, climate change strategy. So we can sort of quantify the carbon impact of that um, but there's other huge opportunities. So we've got a river we've got the River Thames scheme at the moment where we're creating huge swathes of new wetlands um, and, you know, it would be really great. Um, I think this is part of this is a sort of 250 million pound scheme. So I think it will happen. But it's not so easy to understand the carbon impact of of land use change. Um, so as you'd imagine, BNG is something that we are looking at as a landowner, but also as a developer. Um, so that's going to be really interesting. Um, I, think, um, I think a lot of people don't realise, though, that the, the solar farm can actually promote and enhance the biodiversity. In one of the uh, schemes that I'm involved in at the moment, uh, it's quite an interesting one, Katie, because um, the, the land on which the, the it's West Lanx um, Borough Council in Skelmersdale, and they've got a, a, an ideal site for um, a solar farm because it couldn't really be developed at anything else. And it's next to a toxic landfill and all sorts of other um, uh, things that make it very appropriate. But it's got peat on it. And of course, immediately the peat, um, the, the, the P word was mentioned. It's like, oh, well, you know, that will scupper it. But actually, they've gone and got a, a, a peat expert consultant to pre pre prepare a report. And the consultant has said effectively that a solar farm would be an extremely good idea because then the land would be enclosed behind mm -hmm. fencing yeah, and for sure. whatever. And of course, it would mean we'd need a a booted system rather than penetration. They don't want to do the penetrative side of things. But it, I thought that was a wonderful example of how um, a solar farm development can actually enhance nature and biodiversity and biodiversity in that game um, and, and not damage it. And I think that message needs to get around a bit more. Absolutely. OK, so I'm very conscious of time. And Katie, I want to kind of move you, I kind of want to move you back to 
perhaps focusing a bit more on the kind of third party PPA bit that you were kind of talking about before, because there are some other business opportunities here. And I know, for example, you've also been looking at things like PPAs in schools and hospitals and those types of things. So you're able to talk a bit about that and some of the things the council's yeah. exploring. Definitely. So the reason we started to look at PPAs for schools was because we'd been successful in getting some public sector decarbonisation funding from government to decarbonise um, about five schools in one of an earlier tranche. And we were just worried that putting in heat pumps was going to push up the school's energy bills unless we put solar in. And, and that stage of the funding, solar wasn't included as a measure. So we weren't able to fund the solar for the school without any ability to capture sort of the, the savings to offset the capital investment and so then we found out that there was this PPA model that other local authorities and other sort of commercial businesses had been trialing it which was definitely helpful because there was precedent um, and so we piloted um, we developed our own PPA and we piloted it with these five schools and we're currently one school, <laughs> this just to show how long these things take, now has the solar installed, the PPA signed, um, and we and the electricity is being generated. Um, we've got another two schools that we are negotiating with on the PPA, but it's actually been incredibly helpful um, because being able to work with Sharp Pritchard and local partnerships, we now have a really robust PPA um, that we will that we're planning to use to roll out. We've been doing quite a lot of research to understand demand and sort of the sort of the size that the scheme could be. Um, so we've been speaking to schools, we've been speaking to academies. We've also had interest from um, NHS trusts um, and and local and the boroughs and districts within Surrey. So there's quite a lot of interest out there. We just need to go back to cabinet to to be able to deliver this school. And also that PPA can be used um, if we if the the solar farm development that we have. I'm on the closed landfill site um goes further yeah there's 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 two really interesting challenges there the first is related to nhs trust themselves and this is an issue i've been i've been working with a few nhs trusts recently and they they have some very interesting capital expenditure limits now in the nhs which are proving a real headache because effectively if you do a typical ppa type structure where effectively it's like a it's like a finance lease type arrangement where the solar pv is on the roof that falls within their capital expenditure limits and obviously they're already constrained from spending within the nhs so that is already a bit of a challenge to that model and i'm actually working with a few nhs trusts right now to see if there's a way sort of that that can be facilitated with a slightly unique nhs structure so there's some really good stuff there I think you alighted on the different models of schools and I wanted to draw that out because I imagine lots of our local authority listeners will probably be interested in this. So obviously the challenge is slightly different if it's a local authority maintained school versus an academy where obviously you might control as the academy, the local authority might hold the lease for the building, but otherwise you're hands off and local authority maintained school where not only are you kind of much more involved and the building's probably under your control to some degree, but also, obviously, you're ultimately probably liable for picking up the tab. So have you had kind of experience both in discussions with both of those parties? And have you found any specific challenges? It's just worth drawing out probably for. Yeah, we are. We're discussing it with everyone. So nothing's off the table at the moment. And there's different options within PPA models as well that we've been discussing to get feedback that the it is easier to focus on maintain schools. The problem we have is that those schools could academize at any point and so you need to obviously build in your clause that covers you if that academization happens in an ideal world the the contract would would continue but you have to allow for it to be terminated and obviously then that you know your capital investment needs to be recouped at that at that stage um so the other thing with academies is you know it's in some respects you know that won't happen so you you, you have to have a lease, you have to lease the roof, whereas with maintained community schools, that isn't a requirement. But at least you know then that there's, there isn't anything like that that should then disrupt the contract. Yeah. What we're finding is some reticence about the length of the contract from schools. So, you know, the standard PPA ties um, the offtaker in for about 25 years. And it's it's quite interesting how schools react to that because that is a very long term commitment that they're making. And even though you can sort of demonstrate that the, the unit price might always be below sort of, you know, a standard sort of baseline amounts, it does make them nervous. 
Um, so we've been doing a lot of handholding and sort of explaining and taking an open book approach um, because the first question they always say is, is the council making a huge profit out of this? Um, yeah, that is, is no. that, that, <laughs> is, that is super interesting. I think that whole that whole lifetime issue is a massive one and it's not just a massive one in terms of sale, is it? I do a lot of local authority heat projects which come out in exactly the same place. You need a kind of 20, 25 year concession in order to make basically make your money back on the investment plus some sort of half reasonable return. And yeah. and it, I can totally understand similarly from a school's perspective why they go, oh my goodness, 25 years, that's a long time. Why don't I just sign up with Bulb for another tariff for another two yeah. years and it's and it's problem solved. So there is a bit of an education there as well, isn't there, Steve? Yeah, well, that, that's the problem, isn't it? In, 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 in politics, really, it's too short term and not long, long mm. enough term. Can't see past the next election. Um, but, you know, you're right. It's, I, I've, I've done a number of options papers on schools. Um, and I think you've just got to, as Katie said, you've just got to think it through, haven't you? What if this? What if that? What You know, where do the governors come into it? What, what what's the position everywhere but with, I think the conclusion I came to with maintained schools was that actually you can have an offset for that as well because you don't yeah. occupy it the, 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 it's occupied by the the, yeah. the governors effectively under the education law um so there's 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 benefits on that and just the general point on PPAs as well is something that we've uh, we've covered before is that a lot of local authorities own industrial estates industrial and commercial buildings and haven't thought at all about putting solar on them selling the, the energy to the tenant because they're not consumers of course they're business tenants um so it's not regulated under the uh, um uh, and, under the electricity act in the in the in the traditional sense um and again you get the offset because you're not you're you're not actually doing it. so that's one of the ones i always say they should be looking at yeah it's interesting actually that we, we are looking at um carbon offset and carbon sort of the carbon trading markets at the moment and it is something that we would recommend other local authorities do as well so there's some interesting sort of new organizations out there that can support local authorities to do that yeah. um so yeah interesting times yeah yeah no for sure so, so Katie, just I'm mindful of time. I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of put you put you a little bit more on the spot, which I promised you I wouldn't do before this, which is so oh, this is hugely unfair. Um you can kick me under the the metaphorical <laughs> e-table later. But in terms of kind of the perhaps the big sort of two, three things that are really kind of if not stopping progress, the challenges, the sort of big challenges, perhaps money aside, which is probably the obvious one. Um, I just wonder if you've kind of got a view as to kind of if I gave you a magic one, the three things that you might kind of the th the three things that might make your job to to net zero to and past 2030 slightly easier. So definitely there's more that government should be doing. Um, we were a bit disappointed when the um, net zero strategy was released because it didn't answer the questions that we have. Mm -hmm. And so and it also it didn't. This climate change mitigation is not a statutory responsibility on local authorities. And no. therefore, we are seeing that in other places, those teams are getting cut, which is an absolute, you know, such a shame. Um, and that there's a, always a risk that that could happen in Surrey as well, that we're not seeing that at the moment. Um, so giving local authorities powers, putting in place better policies and finance mechanisms, it doesn't even need to be grant funding, but the mechanisms to enable faster and much more scalable investment in this space. Um, so, you know, certain taxes on things we don't want to see and incentives on things we do want to see. Um, so, you know, that would massively help. Um, the other thing we have at the moment is there's sort of we do seem to be fighting against um sort of quite right wing anti-climate um sort of lobby positions yeah that that pop up all over the place and i don't know if that's linked to sort of ai but it that feels like that that's a challenge because yeah. you you really do need to get your residents and communities on side um and singing from the same hymn sheet and understanding the role that they can play so you know that sort of engagement and communications which traditionally local authorities don't do particularly well is can something I, we can need to I, can i stop you on that point because that to me and it kind of ties to the point you were making earlier which is well taken which is that local authorities alone are not responsible for delivering net zero in their areas it's too big a task and it is not just their job and as you rightly point out in fact they don't even have a duty to, 
to it. It's not actually a core part of their functions. It's something that a lot of them are electing to do as good corporate citizens, not as not as not as a kind of core function of local government. But it seems to me that that sales pitch where you act as effectively the driver of clean energy within your local effectively within your local area but you harness kind of community and individuals is is part of it and that is part of i think selling a bigger vision so to what extent does the local authority kind of i I was going to say to what extent does your local authority kind of have a have a role already in sort of the comms around this and and can you talk a bit more about some of the challenges in that regard because i can see with i can see with the anti-climate change stuff that it that's tough Mm. yeah but I have to say, in my experience, it seems to make sense to whoever we speak to that the local authority would be doing this work and leading on yeah. this work. And there is a desire. Every single school almost that we speak to is really receptive and they want our help. And, you know, similarly, we've done quite a lot of work with community energy um, supporting you know, there's a really nice network of um, community groups in Surrey that are mobilising. We've got Zero Guildford, who are quite well known now, doing some really good stuff. So there, it is really positive. And I think that the fact that we are getting, we're pushing against open doors when we do speak to people, that should be recognised by government and they should be giving us more powers and more support to do it because, you know, that makes sense. Um, sorry, I think I've lost the train of your question, Steve. Well, well I, I think the, the alarming point for me, though, about that is that, on the one hand, you've got the contrast between the evidence base, which is the government's own tracker undertaken by Mori on, I think it's a quarterly basis, shows huge support for climate change, for renewable energy, and solar is the highest, so about 87% support. That's on the one hand, and when you talk about the anti-climate lobby, I blame Trump for a lot of that, but it's Trump stroke social media and people posting things that are completely inaccurate, just wild nonsense, like the conspiracy theories um, sort of approach. Um, And yet many people see it. I still get people saying, oh, well, you know, a solar panel, it it never never really um, makes the energy back that's created in its um, um, uh, manufacture. You know, it's embedded. Well, it's just not true. You know, what could we say? It's not true. And that's the the problem. It's really critical. Sorry, the point I remembered, Steve, your point, which I was going to come back on was the way we communicate is that we don't mention climate change. We Mm. mention the other benefits. And Mm -hmm. because we've done quite a lot of research that says that that turns people off. So we talk about health. We talk about waste prevention. We talk about, you know, personal finance. And then we mention green as a secondary benefit. And it's it's a shame we have to do that. But that is what works. Yeah, warmth and comfort instead mm. of yeah. yeah. I guess that I guess the challenge is what that doesn't do is su- is sell all of the agenda. So I can see how that works for solar PV. I can see how that works for kind of solar farms and things like that. What I what I can't see is how that works for energy efficiency in homes. But then I think to an extent maybe nothing does. I mean, ultimately, I suppose that one can come back to it would reduce your bills over time. But it's still a lot more challenging to make that sale, right? It is. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, that that makes sense it is interesting I think to it's the bit that I think a lot of people don't necessarily see and and Katie you've said it and a number of other people kind of a number of other of our guests have kind of said the same thing which is that the local this isn't the local authorities job and it's definitely not the local authorities job by itself local authorities are doing an amazing job actually with all of the constraints they're faced with but they work at their best when they are the when they are engaging with the community to deliver it as well, I think is there. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I'd agree with that. We can't we can't do it without the communities. And we uh, there's some interesting work that um that someone in my team is doing at the moment, which is looking at the an engagement strategy where you we've done we've um I can't remember the name of the um the research, but it looks at the different types of attitudes towards climate change, the different personas. Um and how you can reach them and then you can get this sort of groundswell of support and then you bring sort of people along with you and so that's we're we're testing some innovative sort of approaches in that space at the moment to watch the space we'll let you know if it works yeah sounds great as a as a sort of final thought what do you what do you kind of have next coming up that's exciting what are you what's what's the thing that's what's the thing that's getting you into work in the morning 
there's quite a lot of really cool stuff we're doing but the thing that I'm really looking forward to it goes back to the challenge of of retrofits and um, that you mentioned so we are um we've seen some really um we've had some really good successes with solar together in Surrey because Surrey is a wealthy place there's quite a lot of people there with a lot of money um and so we're now setting up a one-stop shop um for a whole house retrofit approach with because we see that there's people who would invest and do want the services but they don't trust necessarily that they will end up with the right installers yeah. and so we can lend our trusted um reputation um working with installers who we've worked with for a long time through our um fuel poverty decarbonisation scheme so we know they've got a really excellent track record so is that like um, an approved list is that the kind of idea you think is it something along those lines it's a bit more than that so it's a whole it's a whole service end to finish service where yeah. they would get a home assessment that sets out what needs to be done and what could be done and the cost and the savings and then they've got access to installers uh, should they decide to proceed and is the council is the council paying for that? Because one of one of the energy efficiency challenges, I think, is frequently there is some great gov central government support out there, but it's actually targeted at very low income, very low income households, which means there's kind of this great big gap in the middle where sort of nothing's happening. So we were fortunate enough to get um, funding through the local energy authority. To, uh, sorry, it's lead LEAD. Um, you have to. Get that bit out, there, there is there are so many acronyms in this we've had hugs <laughs> and all of all of the various i think i think you can definitely be forgiven for not remembering all the energy efficiency uh acronyms so yeah we got some grant funding which is yeah. enabling us to run this for for two years and then hopefully it will wash its face within that time i think i think steve as lawyers we all, we always look at where the contract is and stuff funnily enough i've just done something myself on that where they were looking at options and f from my perspective i was saying well uh, is the council just choosing somebody here that it's saying this is a good company so there's no contract between the council and the consumer you're just helping the consumer by by you know effectively saying we we can approve this um, body because they've got a good track record etc et and that's quite different isn't it as Steve said are we paying for it where where you've got a contract directly um, that that, um, that that is delivering the service effectively well the contract would be between the installer and the household um, yeah. but we do need to, we will be very much accountable because it, our name would be all over it so yeah. I would oh, say this is very yeah. much a pilot so we are we've seen yeah. it work elsewhere but it yeah. isn't often local authority led so yeah. these sort of community sort of projects so it'll be really interesting to see if if it, yeah. if it works and if we can make it self-financing yeah. in yeah, the time I, we've got i think yeah. they'd, they'd forgive me for saying but i've we've ended up doing quite a big scheming in cambridgeshire and across some of the neighboring boroughs because they work together on it and it they're, they're sort of structured they've got an approved list they've got grant funding they've got forms yeah. of contract that people can call off they've kind of got this suite of things and it's fantastic it's an amazing service and they've even got this excellent sort of color advert explaining these are the bits that you could do and really simplifying it down and it's uptake still the challenge uptake still really really the challenge and it's and it's really really difficult to kind of get people to stop and listen for right okay you want you want to kind of strip out this wall and insulation's going in where now it's you kind of understand the scepticism but there's there's a real challenge there still i think yeah, yeah. yeah. before before we started today steve i was just jot, having a jot down i was thinking what you know what are the barriers to progress yeah. in this and occasionally would be delighted to know that um uh, well i don't think um surrey have most of them in actual fact you you, mm. you seem to have, have managed to find ways through and i had things like internal resources in terms of having officers the officers having the time which again you've mentioned a recruitment um confidence is another one it really is uh, uh, definitely an issue or, or caution is the negative side of that people out of their comfort zone you will know katie that the more you do the more better you feel about it you feel more comfortable with it you you build up scale and so on um uh, and uh, i think that member support of course is another one so when people some people say well hang on a minute we haven't got the resources of surrey county council no that's true but there's still some good examples where this is a very similar thing is being done obviously at a lower lower scale by districts and smaller councils mm -hmm. where they've really uh, grappled with it and, and got going and that's our message i think steve isn't it that there's, there's something in this for everyone what whatever resources you've got whatever tier of government you're in um, um and whatever you're trying to achieve definitely
couldn't couldn't agree more seems like a nice note to leave it on um so <laughs> on that note can i say thank you very much to casey for joining us steve um and we will and we will be back um next month with another topic um so watch this space and do please check out one the supporting article for this and our other videos in the green steve series because there's loads of helpful tips and and ideas for local authorities rolling out rolling out uh, net zero project so thank you very much both for joining us thank you thank you cheers